Good morning, everybody. This is Michael at Fouts Fabs, and what I'm going to be going over today is the uh, Seam Phantom from NSI Solution. Um, this is a Regent, uh, this is a Grand Quartz uh, Stone Products book. The Seam Phantom it runs around one thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars. That's everything in this kit right here. You can order extra things uh, that you might find you need or that you want. You'll go through these three pads and this grinding wheel here periodically and have to replace them. They do last quite a while, but the straight edge, they last forever. The, uh, the actual seam phantom itself that attaches to a polisher um that'll last forever um so the only thing you really have to replace is the pads now it does not come with a polisher in this set so depending on what type of polisher you buy you're looking at another anywhere from two to four hundred dollars for a polisher so i would say you're looking at a polisher and the same phantom kit around $2,000. Um, that, in my opinion, is a cheap price to pay for what it does. I'm gonna show you right here on a couple pieces we have in our showroom of what the Seam Phantom finished product looks like. And uh, then we'll go into showing you how it's done. So we've got these uh, little samples labeled. Seam Phantom? No Seam Phantom. And this is for our customers so we can show them the difference. When a top comes off of our wet saw back there, it does a good job of putting a little cut on it uh, without any chips or anything like that. But you still will have little chips whether they're, you can see them with the naked eye or whether they're microscopic. If you get enough of anything that's microscopic, then you become able to see it with your eyes. That's just how it is. So. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna push the uh, no seam phantom together first here. And if you see it, that's your seam with your no seam phantom. Of course, on the job site, when you put it together, we'll be putting a two-part epoxy with a color pigment in there. But you can see the little chips and uh, how it looks light there. Um, it's not really dark. Now, if we turn it, these are the two sides that I ran the seam phantom on. And if you push those together, that's what it looks like after the seam phantom has been ran on it. Nothing else done to it, just the seam phantom ran on this one and not on this one. So you can see you don't have all those little chips up and down it. It looks darker when you look into it. And we're still gonna be putting our two-part epoxy and a color pigment in there. So once you do that, if you do a good job leveling your seam, your money out there. Now just so you can see what it looks like on this side, what the seam phantom does, it routes this bottom side out. In a perfect world, that'll be anywhere from a 16th to a 32nd inverted. Whereas this, this outer edge here would be an inch to a sixteenth of an inch to a thirty-second of an inch out further. What that does, it makes sure this area here always touches before this area here does. If your bottom touched before your top, that would cause a gap to be in the top of your seam, which would make it more visible to customers. If you look at the one that we did not run the seam phantom on, it's just flat. Now, like I said, our saw does do a nice job of cutting uh, nice straight edges. Um, but you'll have some shops that don't have a really good saw. And this cut right here won't be 90 degrees up and down. It'll be at an angle and the bottom will stick out further than the top. And then you have a bad seam. So here, we've always been a shop that focuses on quality over quantity. Anything that goes out the door, we try to do it 100% to the best of our ability. I don't think any shop could call themselves a professional shop and not have a seam phantom in operation. If a shop lets any seam roll out their front door that does not have the seam phantom ran on it, they cannot call themselves a professional shop. 
it's day and night different when you get out there on a job site with a scene that's had a scene phantom run on it and one that has not. I had bought all these equipment as I'd make profit from each job. The first job I installed and made any profit on, that was the tool I bought. I did one job when I opened this company without a scene phantom, and that was the first job I did. Ever since then, I've had a scene phantom. The second piece of equipment I bought was the Gorilla Grip, which is like the husband or wife to the scene phantom. It's out on the job site and it opens, but I promise I wasn't gonna get off on other stuff. I'm gonna stick to the scene phantom, but uh, just know, I think every shop must to compete in today's market and give customers what they are looking for in terms of quality, you have to have a scene phantom in your shop. If you're gonna charge top dollars for your job, your material, your installation, you cannot do it without having a scene phantom. That's just how it is. So, like I was telling you, all the components that come to the scene, come with the scene phantom. Um, that's our straight edge that we will be clipping here. I'll show you that. Uh, all these are our measuring device. I'll explain that to you. These two little C clamps here, which is used to clamp your straight edge to it. You have your actual seam phantom, which is this here. Um, blow it off just a bit. So it's this apparatus here and this part right here. Um, your grinding wheel, it's all the snail lock system, the pads as well. And then of course you have to buy your polisher uh, separately. And then you just hook it up. You have to have airline and water lines to use this. I actually think they do sell one of these that will hook to a Makita grinder. Um, I have not used that one, so I can't comment on it. I would think it worked just as good as this one. Uh, they make a good product. Um, and, and while we're on that subject, uh, NSI has in no way sponsored me. They haven't sent us any t-shirts, any nothing. No stickers, no nothing. So everything I'm saying, I'm saying because it is what it is. I, I give credit where it's due, and if it's a crappy product, I'll let you know about that too. But uh, this is a good product, and I'm not doing it because they've asked me to. Um, so that's all your components to this scene fan. Now I have purchased a second straight edge. As you can see, it's quite a bit longer than the original one that comes with it. And they even sell a longer one. Well, the reason I have this, sometimes you'll have a large island that takes like two slabs to do. And you've got a 60 inch seam, I think. I don't remember how long this one is, but uh, you know, say you have a 40 some inch seam. Normal seam, you know, is what, 20, 25 inches, 25 and a half inches. So you'll have them 50 inches. You can have them as long as the customer wants them um, or has to have them. So I bought this so we could do the seams and still make them perfectly straight on a longer seam. But also what you can do with this Say you have a new guy in here and uh, he's polishing a very soft stone. Say he dips a piece out in it. He's got a hump in it. Or he messes up the profile edge. So what you can do is you can hook this to it. You can take it over there and run it on your most aggressive pad on that seam phantom and you can straighten that back out without having to recut the top. So that's something they don't advertise on the Steam Phantom, but that is a very, very useful, money-saving way to use that Steam Phantom. Now, in their video, and it's been a long time since I watched it, they start out showing you how to use this on it. I do not use this. I'm sorry, but I tell it how it is. This thing, especially if it's on a softer material or marble or something, it will chip the top out. It was used on this one. You can see how uniform it is right here. 
But you can see you got what? Three sixteenths of an inch right there. Yeah, three sixteenths of an inch exactly. Now you want this as small as possible because with it being polished and smooth like that, the akimi doesn't stick to it real good. You want that akimi on this rough area so that it grabs to it really well. But this rides in here and it will chip that if you're not careful. Also, you have to work your butt off to take that material out with this piece right here. It is, in my opinion, not very aggressive at all. Where we have only a few people that work in here, everything I do, I try to do it as quickly and efficiently as possible, but still keep the quality where it needs to be. So, I use a grinder. <laughs> and I'm gonna go turn the air fan on so we don't have dust in here. And I'm gonna grind this and then I'll turn it back off so you guys can hear me. But I wanna show you how I do it. I always cut little biscuit grooves in mine and then I'll grind it with a grinder. I'm gonna push it out here a little bit so Gary can uh, see this. So. As you can see here, I've routed it back probably about the same depth as we had on this one here. As I, after I run that on it, it'll even be less. I've got the same shape right here. You want to make sure you don't go all the way through the front because then you'll have a gap where it goes together in the front. So you got to leave that area there. And I stay pretty uniform. And I'm at 3 16 or less on this top area so that I can get a good stick with my epoxy. Learn that the hard way. So now I'm going to blow this off and then I'll turn off the fan so that you guys can hear me again. Now that we've got this routed out, next thing we're going to do is attach our straight edge. And like I was telling you earlier, all these are our measuring devices. This right here is basically a measuring tape. So we're going to pull this over. We'll pull this over. And what you want is that to be perfectly flush with that edge. In my opinion, this is the hardest thing to do on this steam fan, is get those perfectly flush. So now we're going to attach these to it. Some people put them on like this, but when you run that, you end up hitting your knuckles on this. So I recommend everybody flips them upside down. That way they do not hit their knuckles. So I just barely snug it so that it doesn't cause that to move. Now down here, you can go up because you're not going to be running by it the whole time. So I'm going to snug this down. And they will move on you as you're tightening them down. We just want to try to get as close as we can. Bump this one back just the hair. Right. 
I am pretty daggone close to dead on here. I'm a little bit behind it on both of them, but they're pretty equal, so I'm going to leave it at that. I'm within a 30 second at least. So now that we've got that, we're going to take these off. And if you've noticed, I've got several inches to the right and several inches to the left. The reason I have that, and this is where the new guys or hard-headed people who just think they know it all mess up, is they don't leave themselves any room. When you run this, you got to go all the way across and all the way across every time. You'll have people that'll stop right on the edge, right on the edge, right on the edge. If you do that, every time you stop, that's an extra second. An extra second. And say if you go back and forth 50 times during that process, that's an extra 50 seconds. And then at the end, you'll see we put a straight edge on here to make sure we're straight. If they stop at that edge every time, what they have is a big hump in the center because they ground that out too much on the edges. And then they don't have a perfect seam. So, most things in a granite shop, if you pay attention and follow directions, you'll be okay. If you think you're smarter than everybody else and do it your own way, you'll probably screw it up. So now, we're gonna come bring this thing back. This is how I've got my shop set up to do it anyway, and, and it works real good for us. Try to leave it out a little bit so that Gary can film us. We've got our high-tech uh, wheel chalk system here. I'll throw those on there so that when I'm pushing, it doesn't roll away from me. Another way to uh, get around that too. Sometimes I'll use my fingers and hold the straight edge and that helps. Just like any polisher, before you use it, you always want to put oil in it for the first use of the day. Clean out my airline. Clean out my airline. So, if I'm actually polishing, I don't turn my water on full blast. On the seam phantom, I do, however. So I've got my water on, ready to roll here. Now there's one more process that I do on the seam phantom that you'll not find in any books or any training manuals or anything like that. I've learned this through experience and just uh, my own personal opinion. If I'm polishing with any pads or anything, especially if I'm using a stone or a zero degrees, uh, zero tolerance wheel or something, sometimes it'll catch the top layer here on the stone and it'll chip it off because there might be a little microscopic piece hanging over and that polishing pad or that grinding wheel or whatever will grab it and chip it. And I noticed sometimes my guys would run the seam phantom on it and it'd be perfectly nice and sharp in some places, but in other places I'd have chips bigger than when we started. And I, I was like, why is that? So I assumed that the pad was hitting occasionally and chipping up the top. So to solve that problem, I keep stones over here now. Both of these are 36 stones. And all I do is this edge right here, it's sharp straight off the saw. I take a stone, you can see I've got grooves in my stone where I've done it previously. And you wanna be careful and don't overdo it. You hold this at a bevel. And you go back and forth. And you knock this off. Just level that edge just a little bit. And I do it on the, f well, I haven't polished this front yet, but uh, I would do it on the front as well if I'd already had that polished, but since I don't have it polished yet, it won't be an issue. So, I don't know how well you can see that, but I've put like a sixteenth of an inch bevel on that. Now, as I run the seam phantom on it, it will take some of this material back, and this bevel won't be on there, but neither will any chips. So it's, it's just something to make our seams that much nicer. So 
Now we're going to start with our first pad. We got a 60, a 150, and a 300. 60 is the most aggressive. It's the one we wear out the most with our snail lock system. That locks into that. We just put it in here. So you can see that again. It just goes in here. Put the wrench on there. Just tighten it down by hand. All right, now we're gonna put this on here. These wheels here, right across this little bar on the straight edge right here. So I'm a little too tight on it right now, so I'm gonna loosen it up. So as you can see, these wheels are spinning as I'm rolling. But if you look down here at the pad, the pad ain't moving at all. So what I wanna do is twist this wheel here and it'll cause that to go in and out. I want to twist that to where it's barely touching that. I twist it, still not touching. Still not touching. Still not touching. Still not touching. All right, I can hear it starting to touch. See how that wheel's moving now? That's where I want to be when I start polishing with the seam fan. So, this little lever right here, it turns your water on and off. So I turn that water on full blast, that's what you got. And that's gonna run against this while I'm polishing. So this lever here, it's gonna turn our air on. <laughs> this grinder or this polisher I bought, it's not my favorite polisher. It takes a little while to warm up, but uh, it'll get there, you'll hear it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with this first pad. Hear it getting louder. As you can see, I go all the way across. All the way. I'm going to tighten it down a little more. About a quarter turn every time I tighten it down. Now I'm And I'll run my finger and feel how much material that I took off. Sometimes you'll take all that off and you'll get the polish and that. That's the only time I use this. If I take that all the way down and I'm totally smooth, I'll attach this on there just to rough that up so my epoxy will stick. So now, I'm gonna take this off. It's real easy, you just put your wrench on there. Give it a little twist, pop it off. Go to my next pad. Tighten it down, you're good to go. You're gonna do the same thing. You wanna find that point where that barely runs. And since those are about the same thickness and use, it's usually right there at it. Now we'll have to do some tangling when I get to the 300. So I'm gonna turn my water back on, full blast. Air power on. Double check and feel of everything. To me, feeling really helps me see where I'm at. All right, I can see I'm starting to smooth out here. 
but I haven't totally got it down too smooth. Now this 300 pad, it don't take a whole lot of material off. It basically just finish times it up. I have had people come to work for me from other companies, and they say they only use the first pad or something. I don't agree with that. This is how I like to do it. I like to use all the pads. Pop that back on. You can see this pad here is a lot thicker than these. And I've already replaced these previously. But this is just a polishing pad. It's just like your 3000 and your 1500 on your polishing pad. You just don't use it. You use it every time, but you're not really working it. So you're not eating that pad up. So now you'll see them like to adjust this back because we're hitting here that pad so much thicker. So we're just gonna back this off. Now, I'm where I wanna be to just barely cut. Turn my water on. explode any of my hoses or anything so like I said I always feel of everything the sink fan will get these stones so sharp especially if it's a piece of quartz or if it's a really uh, dense stone like absolute black or blue pearl I've actually cut my finger when I ran it across to check it so we're gonna pop these sea plants off of here Now, the first thing you should do when you take those off is you want to put this straight edge on this seam and make sure that you've got it straight. And if you look here, we have no gaps. It is perfectly 100% straight. Maybe a little bitty speck right there that's not perfect, but everywhere else, it's damn near perfect. That is a beautiful seam. And I'll do the other side that goes to this as well. And when I put it together, I'll have a beautiful scene. I'm gonna squeeze you this and dry it so you guys can see what we got. So we've got it dried off now. And you'll see a little bit of a difference that the line is not as clear as this one over here that I showed you. The main reason that is, if you remember, I told you in a perfect world, this would only be like a 30 second sticking out. This one here, I wanted the customers to be able to see a good detail of what that seam phantom does. So I wanted this to really stick out. That's why we routed it like that and did it. Um, this one here, it's actually gonna be used. So I wanted this to stick out just as little as possible. So we're maybe to 30 seconds. There's even places I, I've almost got it smooth. In those situations, if it is a little smooth, you can, you can put this bit back on there and run it if you really got out of control and smoothed it. But if you've got just a little area like that, all you gotta do is just take a stone. Just rough it up a little bit. That way your epoxy sticks to it real good. That's, that's the only thing you have to worry about your epoxy sticking real good. So, I would say this is about as close to perfect as you can get. We still got our biscuits cut in here. Now what that's gonna do when I put my epoxy in there on both sides and squeeze it together, that epoxy is gonna squeeze into this one on this side. And on the other side of the seam, I'll have these little biscuit holes too and it'll squeeze into it. And it will harden up and it'll keep that seam from ever moving up or down. Um, it, they, they really make a difference in the seam. Um, if you ever had to break one of Countertop King's seams apart, you'd probably call them cusmic because you're going to have a job ahead of you. Um, 
So we got a nice clean edge that'll probably cut you. Um, we've got the seam phantom routed back, perfect, about a 30 second. We've got our biscuit holes and uh, we're good to go. All we gotta do is do the other side and then when we get to the job site, do a good job putting it together and leveling it. Um, like I said earlier, I think every professional shop needs one of these seam phantoms. Uh, $2,000, it's not gonna break the bank, but it's gonna put you on par with the best of the best in the granite world. So, uh, I really do appreciate you guys watching. We just started another channel. It's called uh, Fresh Air with Fouch. It's what Melissa and I do when we're not in here breathing dust. So check that out if you get a chance. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions about the scene phantom or anything, just you know, put a comment. Gary or I won, we'll get to you and answer it just as fast as we can. And uh, I'll see you guys on the next one.